Okay, guess what? The red button's on, and you've hit play. And that means we're here. Are you new? My name's Jay Brown. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks Podcast. I'm glad you've chosen to listen. Hey, everybody else. Thanks for coming back. How is everyone? Did you have an okay week? Woo, mine was... Long and challenging. Woo, tiring. Are you doing okay? Did you get through your week all right? I suppose if you're listening to this right when it comes out, we just got a new one starting. But man, you can really feel that fall a rolling in, can't you? I have a very exciting and educational talk for you today with Ian Baker. I'm going to tell you about that in just a bit. I also want to say a little something about this blog post that I wrote about unionizing yoga teachers. But first, let me give a quick shout out to the Omega Institute's new podcast, Dropping In. Do you know the Omega Institute? I've talked about it on the show before. It's an institute for holistic studies in Rhinebeck, New York, that's been around for 40 years. It's a real mecca for seekers and practitioners. Some of the most powerful and important teachers and thinkers have taught there. I used to do the core faculty gig there way back when and managed to score a catalog gig last year. It is a really, really cool place. And they got a new podcast. It's called Dropping In. They've got a longtime public radio journalist hosting. Her name's Karen Michelle, and she's sitting down with a lot of these amazing teachers. They're combining clips from their workshops along with these intimate interviews, and it's great stuff. It's inspirational. Their first season is featuring artists and climate change provocateurs, spiritual teachers, health experts, and more. It's the Omega Institute's new podcast, Dropping In. You can find it on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe today. Now, I was saying I have this new blog post that I put out just a few days ago. It's called Corporate Power and Unionizing Teachers. And if you've been around, you might remember a couple weeks ago, I mentioned this New York Times article that was about yoga teachers in New York who work at Yoga Works joining the Machinists and Aerospace Workers Union in New York City so that they could create a yoga teacher union and negotiate for better working conditions with Yoga Works. And it really caught a media buzz, New York Times, a whole bunch of other publications. Bernie Sanders tweets out about it. Elizabeth Warren, the politicians all jump on in support of the unions. And when I first saw the article, I was like, wow, you know, I remember back in 2012, I remember having a conversation about wanting to start a yoga teacher union. I wrote, wrote this blog post called Yoga Students' Bill of Rights. I remember I had some really big ideas back many years ago. So to see it, like, in the New York Times, I was like, my first response was like, hell yeah, power to the yoga teachers, you know? But almost in the same breath, another voice in my head came in and was like, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Yoga Works? What are we talking about? Yoga Works? Yoga Works just closed their Soho location. I think it was like within days of that article coming out, Soho was one of their premier locations in New York. And from what I know, like from the word on the street, and also if you look at like their on paper Yoga Works doesn't seem to me to be doing all that well. They had this model of acquiring yoga centers, essentially. And they were just like acquiring more and more and more. But I, I have a feeling that that has not proven to be a sustainable plan. And I remember when Yoga Works first showed up in New York City. I was teaching at like five or six different yoga centers. There was just so many of these little independent single room sole proprietor places that people would open because the rents were still cheap enough that you didn't even need to make a lot of money to have them. 
And I was just teaching in all these different places, maybe one or two classes in each place. And I just remember Yoga Works came in and it immediately bought four centers and opened Yoga Works North, South, East, and West. Felt like an ominous sign. (laughs) And it definitely proved to be so, but they just swooped in. And I remember I was on a sub list for one of the centers that got acquired. So I got a call from the new Yoga Works manager asking me to come in to be on their sub list for Yoga Works. And I went to the meeting and I'll never forget it, but she handed me a W-9 form, which just had never happened to me as a yoga teacher in the years I'd been teaching up until that point. There was never any W-9 forms. And I really took note of it. And I signed, I filled out the W-9 and they did reach out to me to sub a bunch and I just never did it. Because I just had a thing. I was a weird thing to me that I wouldn't know the person whose name was on my check. And it's funny, but when I had my yoga center in Brooklyn for 10 years, I hand wrote every paycheck. I never did any auto pay or any payment systems. I I hand wrote every single check. So every dollar that a yoga teacher got paid was hand given to them through me, you know? And I just always had a thing about that. So in any case, I still know folks in New York, even though I left a couple years ago. And from what I hear, you know, people who Yoga Work Soho was their home, they're like, wow. And there was like no notice. So it just seems like the timing here where you're organizing to like see if you can get more from the management, well, <laughs> I mean, I, I support them in that effort. But the other main issue for me is really that when I saw some of the kind of comments on social media about it, it was sort of being touted like this is a way to change the industry. And in my mind, it isn't. In my mind, like creating this union at Yoga Works only really is for those teachers who are working at Yoga Works. Like the union is only going to be able to help people who work for corporate yoga for a big company like that. And frankly, to me, the scaling of yoga teaching that a company like Yoga Works exemplifies is the problem. It's the thing that has created the yoga teacher mills and has kind of sacrificed some of the soul of things. And Again, I'm, I, I stand by the teachers at Yoga Works for wanting to unionize and have better conditions, but I also want to say, as a friend, maybe you don't need to work for Yoga Works. Maybe it would be good for Yoga Works to not survive. <laughs> you know, like maybe it would be good for yoga teachers to explore other possibilities and not work for corporations because even with the union I don't I don't see them doing right by us and I really think that it's possible for us to create a more sustainable profession by having more direct relationships more direct connections and finding ways of mitigating the money, rather than just being swayed by it. So there's a lot more to it. Go read the blog post. There's some interesting comments in the comment thread as well. You can check it out. It's on the website. I'd be curious to hear what you think at all. And you know, the voice in me that questions whether or not we should give over self-agency to corporations is the same voice that leads me to the work of my guest today, Ian Baker. Ian has a new book out called Tibetan Yoga, Principles and Practices. He has many other works, and it was a great pleasure and an education to talk with him. I have heard this or that about Tibetan Buddhism or Tibetan Yoga or Tantric Buddhism, And it was really great to 
ask a few key questions I've always wanted to ask about this or that. And really, I learned a lot. Ian, as you will hear, has had a, a relationship, personal direct relationship with the Dalai Lama. And he expressed how the Dalai Lama might be a more radical guy than we might come to think from the way he is presented in, you know, the public eye. That if you actually get in a room with him, sometimes he might express more radical views than you'd think. Well, I get ahead of myself. Ian will tell us all about it. But really, there's so much here. And I'm very grateful to have had the chance to have the conversation. And I'm excited to be sharing it with you today. Before we get to it, let me say something to all of you who are running studios and using Mind Body Online. You know what I'm going to say, a lot of you. I'm going to suggest that you consider today's sponsor, KarmaSoft, as an alternative. Now, let me say something because I got an email from a listener recently who was a little bit upset, felt that I was bashing mind body online. And I, I really don't think that I am. I am in favor of Karma Soft, and I am calling mind body online out by name, which is why I think people get upset. But they have a kind of lock on the market. Most of you out there are using it, you know, and I'm not suggesting that they don't do some things for some people, but it's certainly not right for everybody. And just like I am in favor of individuals maintaining their own agency and not giving over their agency to corporations or internet portals apply much the same way, so I am also a big fan and supporter of KarmaSoft. I was using KarmaSoft at my center long before they ever sponsored the podcast. I know the owner, Rudy Senegal. He's been on the show. Go back and listen to the episode. You can hear all about it yourself. And I really do think it's a better way to go. Do yourself a favor. Go check it out. Go to KarmaSoftOnline.com. All right, other than that, I got a couple of gigs coming up. Let me drop that. I'm going to be in Falls Church, Virginia at the Yogi Underground, October 5th and 6th. I'm going to be in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at the Namaste Festival, October 26th. You can find those gigs and more and all of my other stuff, including that blog post I was telling you about at jbrownyoga.com. Okay. I think that's good. I am going to touch base with you on the other side, tell you about who's coming on next week. But for now, let's get to it. And, you know, let me suggest that if you're not driving or at the gym, like you're at home, you might want to get like a piece of paper and a pencil for this one. Like this is definitely one to take some notes on. Otherwise, you may have to go back and listen again. There's a lot of education here, my friends. So sit down, buckle in, and enjoy this conversation that I had with Ian Baker. Hello, Hello, is this Ian? Yes, it is. Hi, Ian. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good. I'm glad this worked out. I know. I'm glad we managed to sync up across the paradoxes of time and space and internet technology. Exactly. All of that. And then, then the, anyway, all good. And I'm sorry I couldn't get you the book in time. As I said, by the time it was clear to me that I would actually be able to do it this time, then it was the weekend. And It's okay. You know, uh, I've, I've had a chance to, without having read it like page to page, get a good dose of what I think you're uh, offering. And I saw a big talk that you gave and some other interviews. So I think we've got plenty to go on. And I've got some inquiries of my own, which is why I invited you on in the first place too. Great, great. And just out of curiosity though, what were you, what were you doing in Turkey? <laughs> okay, well, yeah, it's a long story. It, it was a, you know, I love this quote from, um, from Kurt Vonnegut, I think it was in Slaughterhouse-Five, he said, strange invitations to travel or dancing lessons from God. And this was an old friend who I hadn't seen in many years who uh, suddenly announced that he was going to the cradle of human civilization, sort of ground zero of human history in Mesopotamia. Uh, 
and would I like to join him? And uh, I couldn't resist because he has a great background in archaeology and history. And this was going back to uh, these incredible archaeological sites, a uh, place called Gebek de Tepe, which is is 12,000 year old megalithic site. But unlike places like Stonehenge, which are six, only half that age, it has you know amazing carvings, symbolic, you know, there's something very extraordinary about this place. So I'd always been intrigued. So anyway, this was to go back to supposedly where the the Garden of Eden was located between the Euphrates and Tigris River, and I didn't ever see that I would get there otherwise. So I took up the opportunity, and I literally just got back this morning to to the UK. <laughs> wow, I I fancy you as like an Indiana Jones figure, my friend. Well, it felt a little, little bit like that on this trip, particularly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am glad to speak with you, and I appreciated you uh, reaching out because, as you may know from other episodes, one of the things that I've been really curious about and has been a sort of thread on the show is an inquiry into the origins of things. And mm-hmm. when I've spoken to um, scholars, they all, when we get when I get them as far back as I can take them in history where they're comfortable going without empirical evidence, uh-huh, right. they, they will all point to this sort of tantric crossovers, you know, and mm-hmm. at the Buddhist origins of some of these things, you know? Right, exactly. But in the sort of mainstream yoga world of sorts, uh-huh. uh, Tibetan uh, you, uh, Buddhism has always been a bit of a sort of offshoot to my yoga teacher friends. Uh-huh. Like it was sort of something they did on the side. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, there's been a couple of occasions, like myself, I actually spent a little bit of time. I had a college buddy, Dachin Thurman, whose father is Robert Thurman, randomly. Yep. So I okay. had some like early exposure to some teaching then. And then I also spent some time in um, Dharmasala and Kathmandu in 1998. Uh-huh. Um, which we can talk about later, but I, I had some exposures, to, my own exposures to Tibetan Buddhism. Right. But okay. in terms of like yoga, it was always a separate thing. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I had one friend years ago who said, oh, no. Well, I should first say the only other depictions of like Tibetan yoga I had seen, I would associate with like a seated posture with a mudra and like some kind of energetic phenomena that's either being visualized or happening inside of that, like very a passive thing, you know? Right. Well, as you saw, perhaps from some images, there's some very dynamic movements in the in Tibetan yoga. is probably the most dynamic of any, uh, in fact. And that's what is a kind of a paradox because it's not something that people are, tend to be aware of. I know. That's exactly what I'm getting yeah. to because I met one person years ago when I was having a conversation with about this. They said, oh, no, Jay, there's... There's these, I met a, a monk who taught me these five movements. And I think mm-hmm. you, you called them magic movements. And there's maybe not just five, like maybe even 108, but that there were these dynamic movement practices that Tibetan monks did. But it was all yes. very secret, you see. It was all very like, it wasn't being presented like in public classes to anybody. And it seemed exactly. to be kind of reserved for a, a chosen few, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, it definitely has that that kind of uh, atmosphere around it for for a variety of reasons, which we can get into. Definitely. Well, well the only other thing I would say is a little bit of a long ended introduction to get to hearing from you more is that the only other thing I would say is that there have been other things that I've come up against. Well, not against, but I've seen that are actually obscuring. Have I think actually turned people off? Like I don't know if you remember in the early nineties there was. Michael Roach had Tibetan heart yoga in New York City. Yes, uh, yes, I do know about that. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, yeah. and so, and then even there's all this recent stuff with the Shambhala tradition. So there's been these occasions, I think, where, you know, what you're writing about in your book is not what Michael Roach was teaching. No, uh, not at all. <laughs> yeah. So just, you know, just to say that, because I do think that that's sort of a, something that did happen in the New York yoga scene that really did sort of color people's view of like Tibetan Buddhism, maybe even. Yeah, um, no, and exactly. No, Tibetan Buddhism, I mean, again, that's, <laughs> doesn't, that doesn't bode well for my book, but in a certain sense, uh, this is, you know, just sort of off the record and confidentially. I mean, there's been so many <laughs> scandal. I won't talk about this because Well, it's well, don't be off the record because we're on the record right now. So don't be okay, off the record. Okay, well, don't no, say no, anything no, you don't want anybody to hear. No, or no, I can no, cut no, it out no. later if we need to. No, it's okay. Nothing be on the record, but... 
Okay, no, it's good it's on the record, but as, he, as, as is well known, there have been these various uh, sort of interfaces, let's say, between contemporary Tibetan Buddhism and the, you know, the uh, hashtag Me Too uh, movement that have led to some rather unfortunate uh, uh, encounters and circumstances and which, you know, have not, have not been good, let's say, for the popular image of, 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 uh, of Tibetan Buddhism, even though it's obviously just, you know, a few cases, but, uh, you know, well, they were very, very prominent ones. Yes, well, well, we'll get to some of that maybe later. First, I what I wanted to get to really is that from what I can tell, having not re- had a chance to read your full book, but just what I've been able to see of it, it does seem like maybe you got a little bit of a, a go-ahead from the big guy himself, Mr. Dalai Lama, to yeah. um, sort of open the kimono, so to speak, on some of these secrets. Yes, and that was very much the case because I'd had uh, you know a long relationship not really, you know, with the Dalai Lama in the sense that I used to bring, you know, American college student groups there for years, long before he uh, won the Nobel Prize and when it was more accessible. So there, uh, and he wrote the introduction to several of my books. And uh, well, when I'm much, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but when did you first meet him? I met him first. It would have been probably maybe I don't remember exactly. Maybe 1986, I think 1985. Um. And what was the what was the context like? How did you happen to bump into the Dalai Lama, or you know, where were you? What were you doing there? Well, I used to run uh, these American college semester abroad programs in in Nepal, uh, starting in 1984, huh. and uh, I did that for, for I think about you know, two years, and then I realized you know there's so much interest in um, in Tibetan studies as opposed to Nepalese studies that I. Uh, proposed a Tibetan studies college semester abroad program that would be based partly in Nepal, partly Dharamsala, and partly actually in Tibet. And in that context, I arranged for the first group to to go to Dharamsala. We had like an, an hour, or as it turned out, two-hour audience with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And then that program went so well that we ended up doing it twice a year. So I was going back for several years, twice a year, to Dharamsala, uh, bringing these groups of students uh, which were, you know, there'd usually be 10 or 12 students, so quite, you know, close relation. But I always arranged that I could have a private audience with His Holiness afterwards, after the students left. And so it developed into a very wonderful, for me, opportunity to have this close one-on-one uh, connection uh, with him, where I would ask about my own practices, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that also led, of course, then to his supporting the various book projects that I did and his writing introductions to them. So it was in that context of, uh, of these university programs abroad that that opportunity developed. I see. And so, I mean, at that time, though, you weren't necessarily revealing all the secrets like you are now. You were just you were looking at those incredible murals. I saw you put these books about the incredible um uh, artworks and stuff. You have several yeah. different books that you were doing in the earlier yeah. times. Like, well, well, that was one of the ones that really was a connection with the Dalai Lama because um, that one called the Dalai Lama Secret Temple Tantric Wall Paintings from Tibet, which was based upon you know a series of um, of mural paintings, as you probably saw, that were created in the end of the 1600s in a private meditation chapel that had been conceived by the fifth Dalai Lama, but only actually constructed during the time of the sixth Dalai Lama, right just before 1700. And the murals were almost like an illustrated guide to enlightenment, according to the most esoteric and, you could say, the the fast track to enlightenment. Um, And interestingly, when I I made a whole set of the original photographs and I presented them to His Holiness the Dalai Lama in Dharamsala, he was ecstatic because he said, you know, he'd always looked down on this temple from the rooftop of his uh, Potala Palace, but he had had to leave Tibet before he uh, was actually able to go into the temple and see these paintings and the practices that they represent. So he was very, very, very excited. And he said, you must make a book about these. Now, that really surprised me because I knew that originally these were considered very secretive practices and I said oh isn't that aren't they supposed to be secret and then he sort of laughed at it and he said time of secrecy is over <laughs> literally that's a direct quote and he Ooh. said that he said there were reasons you know historically in Tibet that these kinds of uh, practices would be kind of kept 
hidden, partly in a monastic context, mm -hmm. uh, but also for other reasons. But he said that's no longer. And then he very jokingly, he said, look at all these figures, you know, in these murals. They, he said, these, they look like you. They're, you know, they're hairy and they're bearded. <laughs> they, they look more like Westerners. Uh, and uh, he joked in the sense that he said, these are actually more important for uh, Westerners to learn about these practices than to learn about multi-headed, multi-armed deities, which are much harder you know, for, for a Western mind to sort of grapple with and understand uh, than they are with these actual, you know, human beings. Um, and uh, and so really he not just encouraged, but really pushed me to, and he immediately sent me off to one of his own uh, teachers, come to Rinpoche, who was a specialist in the kind of practices that these were represented on the wall paintings. And so they were all very surprised because, of course, for them, too, this was a hidden tradition. But with a letter from the Dalai Lama, uh, you know, they became very forthcoming. And then on that occasion was able to go back every day to, to meet with His Holiness the Dalai Lama where he gave explanations uh, of the practices that uh, were uh, illustrated in the painting. So that that really sort of was a, a turning point for me in, in that relationship. And... Uh, the kinds of dialogue that developed out of it. Well, I think it's very significant because it's a conversation I've had on sort of the other side of the my inquiry into yoga history and philosophy, but it does seem to me that some of the secrecy around what you're what you're writing about, um, and you mentioned this, you said that it some of those reasons have to do with sort of the monastic uh, context in which they were held. Um, it does seem like there. I always had an idea around Buddhism and around certain types, certain um, uh, schools of yoga that it that the goal was a, like a transcendent consciousness, mm -hmm. right? And and so you were sort of getting beyond and renouncing this world. Um, and you, I, I heard you say that even this idea of the four noble truths. It was it was actually the four noble truths for those who've renounced life, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's there is this sort of fundamental issue in Buddhism that you could say the earliest phase of Buddhism was certainly uh based upon this idea of renunciation and finding that life in the world was never going to bring any form of satisfaction and so that the best thing you could do was to in a sense meditate your way out of this world and so it was a very renunciatory monastic uh, um, uh, way of life uh, that the buddha himself as far as we understand because nothing of course of his teachings were written down even you know 200 years after his death but from what we understand from the Pali canon it was very much about uh, yeah, a rejection, quite quite literally, of the, the of worldly life because of its uh, inadequacies. And so, for me, uh, it's only through the kind of evolution, if you will, of Buddhism as a philosophy that the tradition becomes more interesting. So, if we have the four noble truths for for the renunciates being the foundational teaching, those. Four noble truths are essentially reversed by the time you get to the, the late, the last phase of Indian Buddhism, which was the Vajrayana, the Diamond Path, or the, the Tantric Buddhist Path, where essentially life is pointed out as being a state of, of, of rather than dukkha, in other words, suffering. It's it's sukha, it's bliss. But we fall from that awareness because of all of the ways we get caught up in our in our mind streams of thoughts, emotions, distractions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, the five mind poisons, as they're called. But those same Qualities uh, can be transformed, and their their wisdom aspects, as it's referred to, can be brought out. So it's really this it's this last phase, if you will, that I find interesting, in which the Tibetans then inherited, um, you know, from the eighth to the to the twelfth century, uh, after which Buddhism essentially disappeared in India. Uh, but the Tibetans, of course, took it, preserved it, developed it in in different ways. Well, um, let me ask you: When does this this thread that you're pointing to where it's not about renouncing life, the, the what, the white robed uh, path, yes. as, you, as you sometimes call it, right? When does that, mm -hmm. that first start? Like, if it started out as a transcendental thing and then there's a, some, this other stuff comes in, why, why does that happen and when does that happen? Do we know? Yes. Well, first of all, uh, 
Buddhism began to to change uh, right from, let's say, the first, second century AD uh, with the introduction of the Mahayana teachings, the so-called greater vehicle of Buddhism, which were in some ways actually in, not inspired by, but influenced by Greek traditions, literally, uh, and even the structure of certain Buddhist sutras. Uh, has a kind of dialectical format that we actually see in certain uh, in uh, in the Greeks. And of course, we know that Alexander the Great, third century BC, was travel you know traveled through this region, was exposed to to Buddhism, and we actually know that the the first images of the Buddha were actually depicted by uh, you know a Greek artisans um, showing the Buddha standing on a pedestal, much like a Greek philosopher would have been shown with hand gestures that were directly equivalent to those that we see in Greek theater. So there was this strange way in which Western artistic traditions influenced the iconography of early Buddhism. But more than that, they influenced the way the tradition began to evolve. So if we look at this, one of the great uh, turning points in Buddhism in this first, second century AD with the Mahayana was this introduction of the so-called Bodhisattva vow. So rather than actually, when we look at the earliest phase of Buddhism, you know, you would meditate to such a degree that you would never be reborn again, and you would sort of out, you would exit the cycle of old age, sickness, and death, and rebirth. You would but meditate actually, yourself beyond it all, right? Well, that's the idea: is that you won't come back. You know, you basically, yeah. you know, there's that wonderful cartoon I think in the New Yorker years ago, where you had a bunch of monks standing at a street corner with with placard signs saying, "Just say no to reincarnation." <laughs> Our nation. And I thought, <laughs> in a way, in a very playful way, it was actually very apt because that is the idea: is to get off this wheel. But when you take the Bodhisattva vow in the Mahayana tradition, which introduced other sort of key philosophical points like like shunyata, like emptiness, um, you make a vow that you will you will remain in this this uh, cycle of life and death and rebirth. Uh, until all of samsara has been sort of brought into a state of emancipation, freedom, and enlightenment. Uh, so the whole very foundational idea of meditating your way out of the cycle, you, you, you reversed it already, uh, you know, from the second century AD with the bodhisattva vow um, of the, someone who defers their enlightenment in order th- through compassion uh, to work for the benefit of all beings without, you know, privileging their own self-interest. So that started then, and then it was around the 6th century, several centuries later, that that transformed in turn into this last phase. There were so-called three turnings of the wheel of the Dharma, the last phase being the Vajrayana, so from the Mahayana, the greater vehicle, to the so-called diamond vehicle or the, the lightning vehicle, the, the fast track if you will, that was essentially tantric Buddhism. And tantric Buddhism, as I sort of inferred, was sort of took this idea of the Four Noble Truths and sort of turned it on its head by saying that life is fundamentally a state of bliss and emptiness. But because of our ways in which we get caught up in our thoughts and emotions and negative negative track, if you will, the we 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 lose sight of our own original Buddha nature, which is enlightened and which is free. And uh, this was a very different kind of teaching than that than what we associate with the what was retrospectively called the Hinayana, the lesser vehicle, or the Theravada, the way of the elders. So, from the sixth century in India, this this kind of tantric infusion into Buddhism began to transform how Buddhism uh, could be approached uh, outside of monastic contexts, non celibate contexts, all the kind of ways in which we tend to think of as the, you know, the colorful, more freewheeling existence exemplified by some of these tantric Buddhist uh, masters of the uh, from the 8th to the 12th century. But it was in the 8th century in particular when Buddhism, when ta- this form of tantric Buddhism, uh, you know, crossed the Himalayas from India to Tibet, uh, mostly associated with uh, with Padmasambhava, who, the, the, the lotus-born master who is often referred to as the second Buddha. And uh, in that context, he established uh, two lineages in Tibet, the so-called white-robed Nakpa lineage, uh, focused on the, who followed the Buddhist tantras, the scriptures of the Buddhist tantras, and the white and the red-robed who followed the, the red, um, the, the Buddhist sutras, which were, 
uh, still based on the Mahayana view of the Bodhisattva, but which did not, uh, in a certain sense, represent uh, any kind of conflict with, with monastic life. Uh, so this very clear distinction between the, the red and the white lineages was established in Tibet in the 8th century. But what we've always seen historically is much more the, the, the red robe monastic uh, tradition, because, of course, that's what you know, has come down to us uh, through the monasteries, through the ritual, through figures like the Dalai Lama, all of whom are representing that more sutric, the sutriana approach. Well, um, you know, I would, I would say that was my, my association. Like I mentioned, in 1998, I did take this trip to India, and I, when we first got there, actually, we, we arrived in Delhi, and we were we were quite tra- traumatized because people weren't very friendly to us. And we were like, oh, my God, what do we, what do we get ourselves into? And my uh-huh. friend who I was traveling with was a, a student of Buddhism. And he said, let's go to Dharmasala. The Buddhists will show us compassion. So we like, <laughs> as soon as we could, we got on a bus and, and headed that way. We stopped in Manali right. for one day, which was a real trip. But we, uh-huh. we went to Dharmasala, and I just remember we spent like a couple weeks there. And I had occasion to sort of hang out with these young monks who uh-huh. were like wanting to practice their English with me and stuff. Right. And I kind of got this glimpse into like monastic orders that I just, I had a very romanticized idea. And so right. to talk to these young boys who were kind of waiting to a certain age where they get to decide whether or not they're going to stay. And a lot of clearly of them were going to leave. Yep. But their yeah, parents for- had put them into it, it, it to, for education reasons and lots of other things. But it yep. was just a very interesting viewpoint of like, oh, there's way more nuance to this thing than we're yeah. getting in the West. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, no, good that but, you had that exposure. And, well, and, and what, I would, what I would also say is I spent some time in Nepal, and I spent time with, a, with what he referred to himself as a Lama family. His name, he referred uh-huh. to himself as Mata Lama, and he, he took me into the foothills of the Himalayas to what he called Hilambu Village. And, oh, and, yeah. that, and that was very, that was like a very different, he was, I remember they were like one night they were drinking alcohol, they were drinking Chang. And one time yep. they were eating meat, and me and my, my friend were sort of confused by that. We had a conversation with him. Uh-huh. And it seemed like that was more of this maybe white-robed idea where they were kind of just grassroots on the down low or something. Yes, exactly. And I think, yeah, so Matalama, this would have been, you know, in the Helambu, which is, uh, you know, from the Tibetan Buddhist point of view, is considered one of the so-called hidden lands. The Tibetans call it Yomo, the, 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 the land screen by snow mountains and then the inner parts of Helambu or Yomo it's exactly like that there's some hidden valleys and caves where Padmasambhava himself had practiced before he left before he went to Tibet and it left this very rich tradition uh, as you say a sort of Lama tradition uh, there where which is very much as you're describing it belongs to what's called the Nyingma order of Tibetan Buddhism which was the old order as it literally means that was founded by uh, Padmasambhava in the eighth century, and it's complete. It's, it was originally a non-monastic tradition uh, based upon, you know, sometimes intensive meditation retreats in caves, and uh, but otherwise, it's a path of integration uh, and transformation as opposed to renunciation of life. So you would definitely see there, exactly as you did, a tradition of. Of, cons- of mindful, you could say, consumption of intoxicants or alcohol and things that, you know, in other contexts would be considered, from a monastic point of view, sort of to be straying from the path. But in this more yogic orientation that Padmasambhava represents, it's really about sort of mastering experience rather than 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 rejecting it. Um, it's about, you know, in a way, transforming those aspects in our life which can be problematic rather than just avoiding them. Well, what I would also say is it felt to me that it was this deep integration of their spiritual practice. Like we went to the stupa every day and the way life happened and the way that we spoke and the way that we focused, as you say, was this very uh, mindful spiritual life. But it didn't have the same formalities. Right. uh, Or kind of, for me, which is why I sort of went away, like the reasons why these things that you're writing about were secret were sort of the reasons why I veered away from Buddhism in general. Like anytime there was like a hierarchy and like a, mm-hmm. and a veil, 
I sort of would yep. rebel against a little bit. Yep. But the tantric thread seems to have run through all of these things. It's just sort of what you're picking up, it seems. Yes, I think so. And so for me, it was that it was only the, the yogic tantric aspect of Buddhism that that held you could say any personal appeal for me. I was much and it was and a lot of that was just simply because I was fortunate enough to meet you know my teacher when I was 19 years old 1977 in Nepal who was very much of the the white robed lineage and uh, a very very powerful yogi and um, what was his name who, his name was Chatral Chatral Rinpoche Chatral Singh Dorji and, and how uh, did you meet how, how did you come to meet him I met him because of my when I went to Nepal originally when I was 19 I did go on a on a college semester abroad program to study uh, traditional Tibetan Buddhist painting because I was an art student at that time and my advisor for the project uh, who was a Tibetan translator in Nepal uh, brought me to see his teacher and this was this Chatra Rinpoche who was completely different from anything you would see in a you know he looked more like a Shaivite yogi than he did like a like a Buddhist monk but incredibly powerful very charismatic and uh, you know, more like a Zen master really and so I was very compelled, uh, uh, and it was through him that, uh, which I developed, you know, a connection to the lineage with. And after I did at his, he said, "Well, if you want to study with me, then you know, first of all, go off. Here's a go off to a cave for a month, stay alone, and tell me what happens when you come back." So it was kind of like an approach of throwing me to the deep end of a pool. Did you do it? Did but, you do it? Yeah. And yeah, what, exactly. what came to you in your month in the cave? What did you come to? to what did you tell him when you returned? <laughs> well, the first question he asked me literally when I came back was, did you meet the bear? And I said, what? <laughs> he said, oh, there was a bear in that cave before you were there. I just wondered whether it came back. But, so it was, and then, of course, it went into all of the kinds of experiences because I did have profound experiences there, yeah. which then he helped to, to sort of, as it were, unravel and decode. And based upon that, then gave me other practices to do. And it just developed as a result a very, very deeply personal um, kind of apprenticeship or uh, path that in a way avoided this kind of overly institutional structural approach that you actually get uh, within the monastic order of Tibetan Buddhism, which became very institutionalized and formulaic in many respects. And, oh, can I stop and, you for a second? Because that seems so significant to me, because that idea of it being this sort of deeply personal inquiry on your part in this person aiding you in that as opposed to sort of an institutional order that you have to kind of fit into that exactly. that's just a really significant <laughs> thing and, and it parallels in the yoga world for sure uh-huh uh-huh um, so interesting you, so that, that that's yeah the, the, i would love to hear more about in the yoga world how that's um understood in tibetan it's called skipping the grades and it's a, a very <laughs> kind of specific grades. kind of approach that literally it does translate as that and it's sort of when there is this kind of close karmic connection between a teacher and the uh, and a student and if the teacher sort of in their own mind at least recognizes that you know that that certain formulaic practices that would typically come before you would do something else would be just kind of extraneous or not really serve the greater purpose um, will guide you in a very personal way that is based upon your own on, on experiences that arise um, through the practices and on that deep kind of, you could say, inquiry. Um, and uh, as it always was, you know, I'd be sort of interviewed after my kind of retreats to see, you know, what had happened, where I was, where my mind was, and just through his observations, it just, and then he'd come up with something else I was meant to do and go off to another even more remote cave for a month. And at that time in my life, that was, you know, I, I, it was, it was wonderful to be able to have the time, freedom and circumstances to be able to, to uh, take that approach. Um, and at this, and then I did tell him after the first retreat, I mean, I had to go back to work. I was working. If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J Brown yoga talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.